Hello and welcome to our MPG primer today. We are fortunate to have as today's speaker, Dr. Sean Simmons, who is a senior computational scientist at Broad. His background is in mathematics. Sean works with Jonathan Levin on analysis of single cell genomic data with a specific focus on understanding the genomic basis of neuropsychiatric disorders. He works closely with wet lab scientists to optimize development of analysis pipelines. And Sean has kindly agreed to take questions at any point during the talk. So if a question occurs to you, uh, we, we encourage you to post that in the Q&A and we will voice it um, as soon as possible. So again, thanks so much uh, to our audience members for joining and, and to Sean for for sharing your work today. Please get started when you like. Awesome. Thank you for the introduction um, and the chance to speak today. Um, so I'm going to talk to you today about some work we've done looking at Ultima the use of Ultima sequencing for single cell RNA sequencing. Um, if you aren't familiar with Ultima, we'll, I'll cover what that is during the talk. Um, but just as a starting point, most of you have probably seen a figure along these lines, um, which is just a figure looking at the number of cells per study in single cell RNA seq studies over the last few years. Um, I mean, this one's a little out of date now, but it gets the point across that just over the last decade, um, the number of cells that you are able to sequence in a given experiment or in a given study has grown so much. Um, I remember back when I started, thousands of cells was great, a great data set. Nowadays, you often have projects with hundreds of thousands, or if not millions of cells. This is great from the biological perspective. Um, but it does come at a cost, in particular, a little literal financial cost. Um, both the cost of the reagents for single cell sequencing and the cost for the sequencing itself um, add up fast. You can see this illustrated um, in this plot on the right from the Satija lab, um, looking at the cost of single cell sequencing. In particular, for the data that they have here, they estimate about 40 cents per cell. Um, which is not much on a per cell basis, but when you have hundreds of thousands or millions of cells, it quickly adds up. So over the years, people have come up with a bunch of different approaches for trying to reduce this cost. Um, a lot of them have focused on reducing the cost of on the single cell side. Um, so using, you know, being able to load more cells into a given 10x experiment. Um, in particular, by default, most people usually load 5,000 to 10,000 cells in a 10x experiment, because otherwise you start running into issues with lots of doublets. Um, but there are approaches such as hashing based approaches or approaches that demultiplex uh, by genotype um, where you are able to identify those doublets and thus load more cells into a given run, reducing the cost. There are also alternatives to um, 10x sequencing. Um, for those who are 10x is the most common single cell sequencing method by far nowadays. Um, but there are methods such as combinatorial barcoding methods um, like that are much cheaper. Um, though they have not quite caught on to the same extent yet. So that's just one side of things. You can also look at the cost of reducing the sequencing itself instead of the cost of reducing the single cell side of things. And this is why we were really excited when Ultima reached out to us a few years ago. Um, at the time, it was a stealth, uh, stealth mode company. Um, it's since had its big debut. Um, but it, the idea of Ultima is it's a new sequencing technology um, that claims to be a 5x reduction in cost relative to Illumina, um, which is ex exciting for the reason, you know, for the reducing the cost of single cell experiments. Um, it's based off a, a something known as most, mostly natural sequencing by synthesis. I'm not going to go into detail about that just because I don't have the background to really explain that chemistry. Um, they have a lot of information on their website if you want more details on it. Um, so we were really excited for this. Um, there are some limitations. For example, it only does single-ended reads instead of paired end sequencing. Um, but we still want to know, could this make uh, single cell sequencing more affordable? In particular, we wanted to test, um, our goal was to test this on some real single cell data sets. In particular, we were interested in understanding the quality and biases in Ultima sequencing, just looking at the individual reads. Um, we wanted to test and see, more importantly, we wanted to see if even what this, no matter what the quality looks like, can we get the same bio, can we get the same biological insight from Ultima that we get with Illumina? Um, note everything I do here is gonna be on 10X single, the 10X single cell platform, just because that's the one we tend to use and it's the most popular. Um, I'm gonna use, and we want to look with both three prime and five prime approaches. Um, for those who aren't familiar, 10X comes, 10X RNA sequencing comes in two flavors. Um, the three prime and five prime approach, where basically the three prime approach targets the three prime end of the gene, the five prime approach targets the five prime end, so up at the transcription start site. 
So an overview of the experiment that we set up, um, we wanted to test a bunch of different use cases. Um, we didn't get everything that we wanted to. For example, we didn't have nu nuclei data. We didn't have cancer data. Um, but we did look at numerous um, different data sets. In particular, we looked at two standard PBMC data sets, um, one a three prime library, one a five prime library. This is just one individual aiming for about 7,000 cells per data set. We also looked at an overloaded channel. Um, in particular, we aim for 24,000 cells here, um, but we because we mixed cells from PBMC from eight individuals, we were able to use the multiplexing approaches to identify doublets, um, enabling the overloading. Finally, we were also really interested in using this technology for a single cell screening. Um, so the idea here is that um, we want to we perform some kind of perturbation in some in a, a bunch of cells. Um, and we want to have a read a single cell readout that also tells you which cells have which perturbations. Um, so it's an idea some 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 much of a CRISPR screen except with a single cell readout. Um, and the, our interest in this is because those often require a large number of cells and this costs a lot. Um, so anything to reduce that cost would be great. So we ran each of these experiments. I, I, I say we, this was almost all done by Shannon Atikonis in our group, who led the wet lab side, um, except for the perturbseq experiments, which were done by uh, Katie and Pratiksha um, and Chris over in um, the Vragev's lab. Um, and basically each of these libraries were generated and split into two. Half of it was used for Illumina sequencing, half of it was used for Ultima sequencing, so that we could directly compare on the same cells. Now, for the Ultima sequencing, we had to add a few extra steps. In particular, um, since the libraries were created, were created for uh, with Illumina in mind, um, we had to convert them to Ultima compatible libraries, which is done with a PCR conversion step that I'm not going to go into too much detail with. Um, now, when sequencing was performed, since uh, we had got out single-ended single ended sequencing reads from Ultima, um, but down a lot of downstream tools, in particular Cell Ranger, um, which is the tool that converts um, FASTQ files into cell quantification information, single cell expression quantification information, requires paired end reads. We had to create what we called simulated paired end reads. Um, Basically, this is take we took the Illumina single ended reads and split them into two. One read had the cell barcode in UMI, which for those who aren't familiar, the cell barcode um, just tells you which cell a, a read comes from. The UMI helps you demultiplex uh, duplicates or deduplicate duplicates, sorry. Um, and then read two corresponds to the cDNA. So it tells you where in the genome these reads come from. Um, this was then processed with Cell Ranger, and, th and this was done with a script from um, Gila over at Ultima. Um, we then ran this through Cell Ranger version 5, and the data was loaded into Surat for downstream analysis. Before we got to the downstream analysis, though, we wanted to look at the reads themselves to see what they look like. For example, one obvious question is, how long are these awesome reads? Um, so here we looked at the PBMC data sets um, to see the length in both the 5' and the 3' prime data. Um, here's just violin plots of the results with the uh, median uh, length uh, labeled. And you can see in both cases, the median is well over 200, ranging from in 207 in one case, 239 in the other, um, which is not bad. Um, moreover, uh, we've been told by Ultima that newer, run, more recent uh, runs have gotten even longer on the order of 300 base pairs, though I haven't actually seen that data uh, myself. And, and the hope is to get it maybe as long as a thousand base pairs someday, but who knows when, if that will happen. Um, one other thing we want to look at was the read quality. So for those who aren't familiar, uh, sequencers tell you for each read and each base pair in each read, an estimate of the quality of that base pair. So in particular, you get a quality score where zero to 10 is low quality, 30 to 40 is high quality, and th anything in between is you know kind of intermediate quality. So we looked at these scores for both Ultima and Illumina, um, which are plotted over on the right here. In particular, how to read these plots is along the x-axis, you have the position in the read for either Ultima or Illumina, where for Ultima, we included both the read one, read two, and then the full length read. The coloring, and then the coloring tells you what proportion of uh, reads have a given quality score. Gray is high quality, pink is low quality, the green is somewhat intermediate quality. Um, and the you can look at at the bottom they you get information about which 
part of the read it comes from. For example, this blue corresponds to the UMI and the cell corresponds to the cell barcode. So looking at the five prime data, you can see that Ultima and Illumina are pretty similar in terms of quality. Um, Ultima has a little bit more of the really low quality, but it also has a bit more of the really high quality, um, but they're in, in the same ballpark. It's not quite the case for the three prime data. We do see a loss of quality in Ultima relative to Illumina at the end of read one and the end of read two. These regions correspond to the regions flanking the poly T. Um, this relates actually to some follow-up work on ours from the Patcher lab that showed that homopolymers are an issue for Ultima sequencing. Um, that being said, the quality, though it is lower quality, it's still reasonable and we were able to get results out of it um, that I'll go more into. Um, but one thing that SIDLI has to do is if you notice at the end of read one, so in this UMI region, um, there is a slight decrease. Uh, this is where like some of the lowest quality is. Because of that, we decided to look at the shorten the UMI for the Ultima 3 prime data from the 12 base pair UMI that's usually used to a shorter nine base pair UMI. Um, we chose nine base pairs um, because um, at nine base pairs, if you were to look at, if you were to shorten the Illumina 3 prime data to nine base pair UMIs, you get basically the same number of UMIs total as if you had used 12 base pair UMIs. So there wasn't a much loss of information there. Um, whereas if you went to eight base pairs, there was a bigger loss of information. Um, John, there's a somewhat related question is, mm -hmm. um, since Illumina doesn't do read lengths over 100, were the Illumina reads trimmed to be an equivalent length for comparison? Or was this mostly, a, you know, was it comparing the technology as well as the length? Yeah, that was something we, um, you know, we debated about. Um, so what we ended up doing for most of the plots I'm going to show you is um, Illumina, uh, you can actually see the lengths here where it's like, Illumina, we're basically using, uh, it basically ends up being around, um, I believe somewhere around 50, um, where it is longer for read for Ultima. It's 90 base pairs in total for Ultima. Um, so that is, oh, sorry, 55 base pairs for Illumina, 90 for Ultima. We did this um, because that's kind of what the, we, we debated about this, but we did this because the length for Illumina is what we tend to use as like our, Bait, like in most experiments, um, whereas for Ultima, this is kind of what they suggested. Um, note that we also looked at shortening um, Ultima reads to the same length as Illumina, and it didn't really seem to affect things too much. Um, Thank you so much. Um, so that, so I, I should mention, we only do this down sampling, uh, this trimming of the UMIs for um, the Ultima three prime data, we, we did look at what happens if you use Ultima 12 base, all 12 base pairs or Illumina only nine base pairs, um, but none of the figures I'm going to show you today are based off that. You can look in the supplement for that information. Um, so one thing we wanted to look at is just, are you getting the same number, roughly the same number of UMIs for a given number of reads in Ultima and Illumina? Um, in particular, we performed downsampling on both Illumina and Ultima to different levels and just looked at the total number of reads that were recovered. Um, this is plotted in the, in the right over here, um, where the UMIs are the y-axis, the number of reads are the x-axis. You can see on the five prime data here, the two are pretty comparable. Um, overall, you do have more reads for Ultima, um, but once you get down to the region where you have enough reads for both, um, you can see they largely overlap. Whereas for the three prime data, there's definitely a divide where you get more UMI, UMIs per read for Illumina than Ultima, though it's not a huge change. It's, if you were to sequence Ultima 30% more, you'd get the same as Illumina, which you can do due to the lower sequencing of Ultima. Um, but, but again, this kind of goes back to, you get somewhat lower quality for the three prime data with Ultima, but not much. Um, So this leads us to a question of how, what, how we're going to do downsampling for the rest of the paper, because we don't want to do downsampling to every level for every figure. Um, so we looked at different approaches, um, and we, we tried all of them on the different data sets. Um, the one we used for the most was the obvious one, downsampling Ultima and Illumina to the same number of reads total. Um, but you can make the argument that, well, Ultima is a lot cheaper, so you might want to sequence Ultima more deeply. Um, so we looked at both sequencing Ultima 
just deeply enough so that it has the same number of UMIs as Illumina. And then also just using all the Ultima reads and all the Illumina reads, um, which correspond to in all the, at least in the PBMC data sets and the PerturbSeq data set, that would be two to three times as many uh, Ultima reads as Illumina, uh, which for most of what I'm going to show you, everything with the QC metrics is going to be done with down simply the same number of reads. Um, the work with we do with the single cell uh, screen at the end, the perturbed seek was the same number of UMIs. And Sean, in the different, in addition to differences in numbers of reads, do you see any biases due to the chemistry, um, like you know, pack bio with long reads, um, you know, seeing uh, TSO and other kinds of changes to actual reads, not just uh, depth or length. Yeah, no, there are definitely biases. Um, so there are some like biases in terms of like GC content. Um, so that's what you're talking about. Um, I'm also actually the next in a few slides, I'm going to talk about some of the biases at more of the gene level, um, where you get like slightly different regions being targeted by the reads. Um, Interesting. Uh, but that, a lot of that also has to do with the single end versus paired end technology. So it's kind of hard to, you know, separate the two. Um, Makes but, sense. Thank you. Yeah. Hopefully that answered the question. Um, so um, the next step was to look at some basic QC. Um, in particular, we want to look at the number of genes and the number of UMIs per cell for both technologies, um, which you can see as violin plots over here, again, with the median um, labeled. Um, you can look, see looking at the five prime data, um, the Illumina sequencing has slightly more genes per cell where the Ultima is likely more in UMIs per cell, um, but the two are pretty comparable. Heading over to the three prime data, we see what we've you know seen in the downsampling plot, which is that you do get somewhat more genes and UMIs with Illumina, um, though Ultima still has a reasonably high number. Now this is at the whole cell level. You can look at the individual gene level, um, which we did here. Basically, we looked at the um, aggregate expression, um, so the pseudo bulk of either Illumina of Illumina and Ultima in both the five prime and three prime data, and plot it, the, the results. Um, so each dot here is a different gene. Um, you can see in both cases it's large, it's very highly correlated with Pearson around 0.98. Um, but there are definitely outlier genes here um, in both cases, um, and the question becomes where are these outliers coming from? And there, there are a bunch of different, you know, getting back to the bias issue, there's a bunch of different reasons that these genes are different. Um, the one that stuck out to us in our analysis, however, uh, was just this uh, issue of the where the reads fell. In particular, because we're using single-ended reads, because Ultima has single-ended reads, whereas Illumina is paired end, um, what you end up is the, um, the C region that you're getting for the cDNA is going to be, there's going to be less of a gap between that and the cell barcode in UMI. Um, in practice, what that means is that for five prime data, the cDNA region you're getting from Ultima is going to be closer to the five prime end. And for three prime data, it's going to be closer to the three prime end um, compared to Illumina. You can see this illustrated here where we're looking along the length of the gene from the beginning to the end. Um, and we plot the density. Um, this is averaged over all genes where each gene is normalized to have the same, um, to have the same effect. Um, to have the same count. And you can see that the Illumina data has, is much is more five prime biased and the Ultima data is more three prime biased. Now, this might seem like a small thing, but um, as others have shown, um, including some from the Regev lab, this can actually lead to issues even in Illumina sequencing. Um, in particular, we, this is kind of one example here. Um, for those who aren't familiar with IGV plots, this is plots the, along the genome here um, on the x-axis. At the bottom, you have different annotations for the genome, uh, for the transcriptome, sorry. In particular, at the top here, you have this tra trans the transcript for lil RA5s, um, where the X this is the exon, this is the intron. And then you have density plots of where the reads fall in both Ultima and Illumina, where the blue reads are the reads being assigned to this gene. The red reads are the genes, reads not assigned to this gene. And what you notice is there's a lot of red reads in Ultima and very few in Illumina. And in particular, the reads, basically you get a peak of reads, but it's just past the end of the annotated transcript. And this is leading to these reads not being counted um, because of the way Cell Ranger uh, works. Um, 
So there are a lot of ways around this. For example, you can work on extending the reference. Um, in particular, you can see there's two different extensions, either using bulk data or single cell data at the bottom here, um, which are able to recover these reads. Um, we don't we don't use these extended references in the rest of the paper, but it is one approach that can help recover a lot of the reads for um, Ultima. We, we also tried single ended uh, sequencing with Illumina and actually got pretty similar as a result. We got better concordance for a lot of these genes with um, Ultima than uh, with the paired end. Um, so all that together makes us think that this single end versus paired end is one of the major differences um, that leading to one, a lot of these transcriptional differences. Um, so that's kind of all the technical side of things. Um, but what we're really interested in is the biological side of things. Um, looking to this, we wanted to start with um, the P one of the PBMC data sets. I'm sure that we, we did this kind of analysis for all the PBMC data sets, but here I'm going to focus on the mixture data set. Recall this is a mixture of PBMC data from eight individuals, but aiming for 24,000 cells um, that we can demultiplex by genotype. Um, in particular, you, basically the idea is you use the genotype information from each individual to tell which cells go to which individual um, and tell which cells are doublets, so are coming from two different individuals, so you can remove those. And to do this, we use a tool called Vireo. Um, I'm not going to detail how it works, um, but what you get out in the end are these donor labels for each cell. Um, and in particular here on the right, you see a bar plot. You see a plot with the... Um, number of cells assigned to each donor um, in Ultima and Illumina. And you can see there's very good agreement in terms of the number of cells you're getting out um, for each donor. Um, you also see that if you look at an individual cell, 92% of the time, the donor label agrees. But this includes cells that are either doublets or unassigned. So unassigned cells are cells where they can't tell where they're coming from. Um, when you look at cells that are assigned as singlets, by which we throw away anyway, so we're not too worried about those. Um, but if you look at cells assigned as singlets um, by both methods, then you see that there's greater than 99.9% .9 agreement. There's less than 10 cells that disagree between the two um, if you look at only singlets, which is, we think, pretty good. So now that we have an idea of which cells come from which donor, we can start asking some you know, standard questions for single cell RNA-seq. For example, we can ask, can we identify the cell types that we expect? Um, often this is done by clustering. Um, to avoid some of the issues that come with, you know, arbitrary cutoffs in terms of clustering, things like that, we decided to use an alternative approach called azimuth. For those who are familiar, azimuth is an automated tool where you take a pre-existing, a pre-annotated data set, um, in particular a data set, in this case from the azimuth website, um, and you use it to annotate your data set. Um, basically, you transfer their labels over to your data. That we found, and then we found this method works pretty well in previous um, works. So basically, we applied this both at looking at this more general cell type level. So looking at, for example, B cells versus CD4 T cells, things like that. And then looking at subtypes of T cells as well. So over on the right here, you have for each donor, we plot the proportion of cells assigned to each cell type um, by Illumina and Ultima. And you can see there's pretty good agreement in terms of the proportion, um, even the presence or absence of cell types. So for example, this light blue one, you know, is present in some, but not others. And that largely agrees between Illumina and Ultima. Um, if you look at an individual cell, if you look at this more general cell type labels here, you get 95% agreement on which cell is assigned to which cell type. And a lot of the disagreement is just between, for example, closely related cell types. So NK cells versus CD8 T cells or different types of T cells, things like that, um, that are kind of harder to label. Now, this is looking at just cell type annotations. You can also look at these marker genes. In particular, in a previous publication, we came up with some marker genes um, for different PBMC cell types. And we wanted to see if those showed up where they should in both Ultima and Illumina sequencing. And so we made basically heat maps here that looked at the average expression um, of particular of different marker genes where the marker genes are here. Um, the color bars tell you which cell type they're supposed to label. And at the bottom, you have the different cell types. So they're basically looking at the average expression in both Ultima and Illumina for these genes. And there are two things worth pointing out here. First is that Ultima and Illumina are not perfect replicates, but are extremely close in terms of the heat maps. And moreover, if you look at where the different uh, you know, marker genes are, they light up where they should. So for example, the B cell markers 
light up in the B cells, um, the you know NK cell markers light light up in the NK cells, and so on. John, there was a question as to that five percent um, mismatch. How much of that do you think was due to five prime and three prime biases, or was it kind of changes in expression level, um, perhaps due to reads not being assigned? Yeah, I honestly don't know. Um, <laughs> I, I mean, it might be hard to answer. I guess we do have the single ended for at least for the five prime data. We could try looking at that in the PBMC data five prime data where we have the single ended reads, and that could help answer the single ended versus pair end bias. Mm -hmm. um, so I honestly don't know. Um, it, part of it could also be there's you know some random randomness in like which reads are being selected and things like that. So that also probably plays a role. Um, but it's it's a good question, and I honestly don't have an answer. Yeah, people are clearly very interested in this technology. So. Um, yeah, this is one way of looking at marker genes, um, but you can also try to extract marker genes from your own data set. In particular, you can use differential expression between cell types um, to identify which cell types are marker genes, um, or which genes are marker genes for a given cell type, sorry. So in particular, what we do is we take this data set and we compare each cell type to all the other cells in the data set using a tool called Presto. Um, we use that tool because it's easy and fast. Um, and it's you know pretty standard. It's very similar to the find markers um, approach that is used by the uh, Surat in general. In particular, we took the log flow changes estimated by this program um, for each cell type and compared them between ultimate Illumina, which you can see as these plots over at the right here for each cell type. And you can see just looking at them high, very high correlation. Um, they largely agree in terms of the log flow changes. Um, with correlations ranging from 0.93 to 0.95 um, with you know there's an occasional outlier gene but there are relatively few of those even um, so we felt like this is a pretty good uh, agreement in terms of differential expression um that's kind of what we looked at at the pbmc data um there were other questions we tried to answer as well i'm just not going to go into them due to time um, instead, I'm going to move on to the single cell screen. Um, so in particular, um, we're interested in basically the idea where you have a lot of different perturbations that you're interested in. Often these will be um, different guides in our case, where each guide will knock out a different gene. Um, and basically what you're interested in doing is putting these perturbations into a, a bunch of cells then sequencing those cells um, and getting a readout of both of the single cell sequencing expression and of which cells have which perturbations. And this allows us to relate um, the perturbations, um, in this case, the guides, um, to the changes in transcriptome, the transcriptome at the single cell level. And there are a bunch of different approaches for doing this. You know, he, a lot of you have probably heard of PerturbSeq or CropSeq. Um, so we wanted to test PerturbSeq with the optimal sequencing technology. Luckily, some of our collaborators, um, in particular, Katie Pratiksha and Chris over in Aviv's lab, along with Arit, um, had a small pilot screen for a larger perturbseq study that they were doing, uh, consisting of about 20,000 cells. Um, they were in a, um, I'm not going to go into too much detail on the biology just because I don't want to you know, steal their thunder, um, but they perturb, they were melanoma cell line where they perturb a lot of different genes. Um, each with in each gene, they perturbed with multiple guides. Um, where in a, in, a, in the cell line, um, then they perform sequencing on those cells. Um, in particular, this is slightly different than a standard perturbseq experiment because they um, enriched for gene because they enriched for genes which low HLA expression. Um, the idea being that there was interest in the guides that would lead to this lower expression. Um, so if you performed so if you sort for those, if you sort based off that, you would get the guides that you cared about enriching for them. Because otherwise, you'd have too many guides for the number of cells being sequenced. Um, once the sorting was done, this, these cells were then sequenced with, you know, single cell with the ten, standard 10x three prime um, sequencing. Um, and then we took that and applied either Ultima or Illumina sequencing to that. Um, 
we also had to um, perform both get out both dial out information. So for those who are familiar, dial out tells you which cells have which perturbations, um, and hashing information where the hashing tell, allows you to um, overload the cells. So basically, identify doublets. Um, it should be mentioned that both the dial and the hashing were done with Illumina sequencing. Um, we didn't bother redoing it with Ultima, both because there were some technical issues due to the single-ended nature um, of Ultima, and because the amount of sequencing for the dial-out and hashing is much, much smaller than the amount for a single cell. So most of the cost of sequencing goes for the single cell sequencing, so we are more interested in looking at that. Oh, sorry. So once we had this information, um, we applied uh, Cell Ranger, um, which allowed us both to get the information about, you know, the expression information, but also to assign cells to perturbations. Um, and then we used the tool called DMUX EM um, to assign cells to, to use the hashing data to remove the doublets. Um, which, once we did this, we were able to identify cells that were singlets, so cells that the at least DMUX EM did not think were doublets and which were assigned to a perturbation um, where the perturbation, we only looked at perturbations with at least 10 cells. So we had some power to detect uh, what was going on. Um, it should be mentioned that there were cells assigned to multiple perturbations, um, so multiple guides, but we removed we remove those from consideration. So just to understand, um, this is basically looking at the number of guides per number of cells per guide um, in this data set. Um, just to, so you kind of understand the naming scheme. Basically, each guide has first the gene name. So this is the gene being targeted by the guide and the guide number. For example, STAT12 is the second guide targeting STAT1. We also have two control guides, Intergenic 1 and Intergenic 2. There are other controls as well, the non-targeting controls. We didn't include those uh, just because otherwise these figures would get quite, quite busy uh, quickly. So. Um, it's also worth mentioning you see very good agreement on the number of cells per gu guide for Ultima and Illumina, but this is probably not surprising given that we're using the same dialogue data in both cases. Um, so we have the um, information about the... Um, ex so basically for each cell, we have information about the expression of that cell. And then which gene, which guide is you know present in that cell? So which perturbation is present in that cell? And there are a lot of things we can do at this point. One standard one is just answering the question of which guides um, are have similar transcriptional effects to which other guides. There are a lot of ways of doing this. We use an approach from the original PerturbSeq paper called Mimoska, um, which is basically an elastic net based approach. I'm not going to go too much details about the technical side, but what you end up getting out is for each guide you get an estimate of the effect of that guide on each gene. You can then look at the correlation um, between guides of these effects. Um, and this gives you kind of a, cluster, a correlation between each pair of guides, um, which is pictured in these heat maps on the right here. Um, so you can see the two look very similar, um, Ultima and Illumina. In particular, you get this big cluster at the top um, with the STAT1 guides and this IRF1 guide. You also get you know some other subclustering with uh, CREB P and then COP1 over here. Um, so a lot of the same structure is present in both, uh, which we thought was a good sign. Um, that's looking at a more global scale. You can also look at individual genes. In particular, you can compare the cells with a given guide, a given perturbation to the cells uh, with the, uh, the control um, perturbation, in this case, the antigenic one control. Um, we did this with a tool called Nebula. We actually tried a bunch of different tools and they all gave pretty consistent results. So we stuck with the first one we tried. Um, and what this gives you is, you know, for each guide in each gene, it gives you, tells you whether or not there is significant differential expression in that gene in that, for the cells that have that guide. Um, and then it gives you an estimate of the log flow change. So over on the right, we have these plotted. Um, so at the top, these are all the differentially expressed genes. So these are genes that are express, differentially expressed in at least one by at least one guide. Um, we have the log FOG, and the different guides are along the x-axis down here. Um, you have both Ultima and Illumina. The y-axis is the log FOG change um, with confidence interval, 95% confidence intervals, and red indicates uh, significant, um, black indicates not significant. 
Um, the things that kind of stand out are you see good agreement in terms of the direction and size of the effects between Ultima and Illumina. In terms of which individual genes are significant, you do see a lot of agreement, though it's definitely not perfect agreement. You definitely see a bunch that are significant in one, but not the other. Um, but given the small number of cells, that might not be surprising since um, even a little bit of randomness could easily lead to differences in significance. Um, so it's not a perfect replication, but they are very similar. And I think you end up getting the same number of differentially expressed genes in both, at least within one or two genes. Um, so they seem to have fairly similar levels of power in that sense. So that's only looking at the significant ones. You can also look at the non-significant genes, the differential expression results for them. In particular, you can look at the p-value from Illumina and Ultima for each of these differential expression comparisons. And you can see very high correlation. Um, similarly, if you look at the log fo change, uh, you see good correlation as well. It's worth mentioning that this one, we only use p-values that, or we only use comparisons that have a p nominal p-value less than 0.05. Um, just to avoid having a big noisy cluster at the center. Um, that's kind of, um, that's what I'm going to show you today. There's other analyses in the in our paper if you want to go and look um, and you have interest. Um, some takeaways. Overall, at least for the metrics that we looked at, um, Ultima and Illumina seem to give pretty similar biological insight. Um, three prime, the three, three prime Ultima data is admittedly a bit lower quality than Illumina, um, though the five prime data seems actually pretty comparable on a global scale. There might be individual genes where this is, you know, not the case, um, and it's worth looking into that. Um, the Ultima does have this limitation of the single-ended reads. Um, it's unclear about how long if this will change in the near future or not. Um, but at the very least, this means that you have to be a little careful with your annotations with Ultima um, and just be aware that you could have reads falling off the ends of genes um, due to the single-ended nature of Ultima. Finally, it's also worth thinking about these the tools we use for this, the read mappers, things like that, were all built for Illumina. So the question becomes, if we use a tool built for Ultima um, that takes into account the particular you know, error modes in Ultima sequencing, maybe we could improve the results for Ultima as well. For those of you who are maybe interested in Ultima but aren't necessarily single cell, interested in single cell data, there have been a lot of other papers, preprints put out um, that looked at other data types. Um, and particularly if you go to the Ultima website, they have a long list of these. Well, at least relatively long, um, but it's a growing list. Um, and in particular, there's been a lot of work fo with follow up um, from our own data set. In particular, it feels like everyone who has an alternative to Cell Ranger has tried their tool on ours. Our, our, on the data we um, our group produced and uh, reported the results either in a preprint or on Twitter. So if you're interested, it's worth looking at that as well. And finally, I just need to acknowledge everyone because this is a big group effort. Um, in particular, um, it was led by you know Joshua in, our, in the Levin lab, um, as well as Aviv and Arit. Um, the what lab side was largely led by Shannon Aconis. Um, with uh, help on the perturb seek part from Katie, Pratisha, and Chris, who are also involved in you know, all parts of the paper, but um, the perturb seek paper part in particular. And finally, I want to thank the Ultima Genomics uh, team who work closely with us, uh, particularly their competition biologist, Gila, um, who did a lot of the upstream analysis, uh, as well as much uh, some downstream uh, analysis as well. Um, and yeah, happy to take any other questions, and thank you for listening. Thank you so much, John. I think uh, there's obviously a lot of interest in this technology and its potential to kind of improve our characterization of the transcriptome. Uh, there was one question that did come up for the PBMC um, portion of your work, which was, was there Im any impact on the discovery of mitochondrial genes between Illumina and Ultima? Um, you know, kind of the data already exists, but was there any skew based on the, the platform use? So I don't know if we looked at mitochondria too closely in particular. Um, it did definitely did not pop out at some of the top effect genes. Um, it was like, you know, if, if we looked at the ones that were, if you were, let's see, we had a, I had a scatter plot earlier that compared on the gene level. Let's see if I can get back to that quickly. Um, but along, 
like if you look among the top genes, there's I think one, yeah, there's like this one mitochondrial gene up here that's one of the outliers. Um, but overall, I don't think there were, I guess there is another example over here. Um, but I don't remember mitochondria as a group, uh, mitochondrial genes as a group st sticking out. Um, and it looks but like there's one on either side of the, you know, one more in Illumina and one, one more in Ultima. Yes. Yeah. Interesting. And then, so please, if anyone has any questions, feel free to type in the Q&A or raise your hand and uh, we can unmute you to, uh, to voice your question. Um, but I was wondering, oh, sorry, here's one. Um, so great presentation. Uh, this is from Matthew Cool from the Genomics Platform. He was saying that they'll be extending their applications for running 10x3 prime and perturb seek on the Ultima platform. Um, and in addition to the wet lab work, Ultima will release some software tools for the pre-processing of their single end reads to look more like paired end reads. Um, and so if anyone wants to run more samples, uh, please reach out to Matt Cool. Uh, so it sounds like it will be an emerging technology that we'll see more and more of. What did you think was different in terms of your pragmatic experience of work with Illumina versus Ultima Reads? Obviously, you have a great amount of specialized knowledge, but for many of us who are cons consumers of um, the pipelines that are developed, um, were there any particular learning points that you would want to share? Yeah, I mean, I, I feel like once you get past the like initial pre-processing steps, um, the you know splitting the splitting into paired end reads and then um, pot, dealing with annotation, um, possibly annotation issues. It's in in the end you get something that's very similar, um, and there might be slight biases one way or the other. But at least for the applications we looked at, um, there weren't big differences in how we would use it downstream of that. And what's the potential? Do you think for integrating data sets? You know, it, as people perhaps migrate between more platforms than are currently being used for single nuke, but we still ultimately want to make integrated atlases. Mm -hmm. um, do you think, based on your experience, that will be uh, feasible, or that people have to kind of commit to a platform for a given um, analysis? Yeah, I mean, it definitely would. It makes the analysis trickier um, to, uh, you know, com combine between platforms. Uh, that being said, we did try combining the PBMC data from the um, PBMC data from the Ultima and Illumina, and we were able to using standard batch correction methods, and it combined pretty well. So I think that depends probably somewhat on the question being asked, um, you know, downstream. Um, I think you know. I don't know if it's any worse than the other kind of bias, like the other kind of differences in technology that you get in these, uh, you know, large, large atlases where sometimes you're doing different, you know, single cell methodologies or, you know, different. And even batch to batch, right? There yeah, exactly. Variation, yeah. Yeah. Differences in, you know, the pre-processing, uh, all different kinds of things. Yeah. That's exciting. It's nice to think about having all these different platforms to kind of optimize for our question. Great. Well, that was super exciting to hear about this new technology and um, uh, even more innovations to come. And so thank you so much for joining us this morning. Yeah, thanks for the chance to talk.